graduating in geology and zoology from Manchester University. He joined the South African Museum in 1983 and gained his doctorate through this university in 1990. As curator of Karoo Paleontology, worked on many projects under the general heading of Paleoecology of Gondwana. His research is mainly field-based and integrates paleontology, paleontological and sedimentological data into paleoenvironmental reconstructions of ancient landscapes, especially concerning the end Permian mass extinction event. Roger retired in 2016 and is currently working as a distinguished professor at the University of the Witwatersrand. Please welcome Roger. Yes, I'd like to uh, fill your next hour and a half or so with um, with some work that I've been doing recently in the East African Rift Valleys, and it is focused around the end Permian mass extinction. Uh, but uh, as you'll see, I'm uh, taking you from the Permian times into the Triassic times and uh, seeing what was happening in uh, these these narrow geologically controlled uh, sub-environments of the main Karoo Basin of South Africa, these sort of small little enclaves up in the middle of Gondwana at this very critical time in Earth's history. Can I drop, yes. drop your... been to my lectures before, this is always my first slide because it is the fundamentals that I'm looking at in, in um, everything that happens on Earth is, is somewhat influenced and sometimes very much influenced by plate tectonics, that is now the hot magma, the hot rock rising out through the cold solid crust creating something uh, that is apparently unique in the uh, in, uh, solar system, perhaps in the universe, but certainly in the solar system where we have this, uh, the possibility of, of uh, water, liquid water sitting on the surface of the planet, yet uh, hot rock rising up through it, forcing the surface to, to go into convulsions, if you like, uh, that is the moving around of the continents on the surface, creating sub-environments or different environments all the time. And this is the one we're going to be talking, talking about a lot in this, uh, because that is the, today, that's present day manifestation of the rift system that has been going on since Gondwanan times. And of course that rifting is due to the heat from the center of the earth being uh, um, the, the, the nuclear furnace down here, the, the um, nuclear fission that's taking place down there that is uh, creating heat in the, the solid core, melting the rock around it, and forcing it out through cracks in the solid crust, uh, especially along the mid-oceanic uh, ridges, forcing the blocks of crust to collide, and you get the uh, phenomenon of subduction, where old crust is sucked down back into the mantle to be remelted, to be recycled, and the whole process uh, is self-perpetuating. What we're looking at, what we're particularly interested in, is where there's this hot rock rising, uh, we get the pulling apart of the solid crust on the top, and that effect puts the crust into extension, and the extension then is released through uh, faults. These are parallel systems of, of, of breaks in the crust that allows then some blocks of the uh, crust to drop down, 
and that creates a, a surface depression, a linear surface depression, which is what I mean by a rift valley. That is the setting now of the uh, of all the uh, other stuff that I'm going to be talking about in the next, uh, the next uh, uh, hour and a half or so. In the Gondwana times, we know that uh, uh, obviously all the continents, were, southern continents, were all together like this, and there was this mountain uh, system uh, all the way along the southern Gondwanite mountains, caused by a subduction of the uh, Pantalassian Ocean crust into uh, into the southern margin of Gondwana, creating the Gondwanites and a lot of depressions on on the uh, landward side of this uh, supercontinent were filling then with sediment and it's in these uh, large sag basins or foreland basins that we get uh, the biggest uh, deposits of Karoo aged uh, strata and uh, this is my study area basically that's where I have to go to, to that's where I've been in my whole careers working on these uh, foreland basins but I'm now more interested in what was happening uh, outside of these basins uh, as well as the, the main foreland system. And if we uh, look at a, this area in more detail, we'll see that these are the big sag basins in the uh, Triassic period. Uh, um, and uh, I'm particularly uh, homing in on that Permo-Triassic boundary as, a, as, a, as a, a key moment in geological and uh, the, the uh, geological and uh, the history of life on Earth, where things, uh, big changes happened uh, that uh, eventually led to the, uh, sorry, eventually led to the, to mammals. Now, I just want to, to back up slightly on the tool. What, what, uh, what did I do there? I just want to back up slightly. So these are the uh, these are the basins that I have been studying, or am studying right now. In fact, all of these I have projects running in yes, in all of these uh, right now. Uh, so it's, every year is very busy year because I have to try and keep my field work up in all these different part places. But you'll see that uh, my main work and for my lifetime, lifetime's work has been in this big basin, the, the Karoo Basin. But now I'm concentrating on these rift, uh, peripheral rift basins around it because I have the idea that uh, it, or even though the Karoo is this like benchmark for, for international uh, paleontologists to all come and see the biggest, uh, the most continuous uh, layering of rocks and fossils through this time, it may not have been the most important ecologically uh, in that it was a very big open basin, all very similar. Whereas in these rift valleys, every rift valley was in a different latitudinal position. So every rift valley had its own little microclimates, if you like, and it's these microclimates that drive evolutionary changes. This, it's, this, it's the variation that occurs in the rift systems, not just by the movements of the land, but also the, um, the drifting of the continents through different climatic belts that creates these, these, these hubs, these hot spots for diversification of species. So we're going to go to those two. That's where I'm looking at the, for, this, the, for this talk. And I just want to do this one. I know you've seen this before, but there's the breakup of Gondwana. But the uh, Im important thing uh, here is just to, to, to show you where the, that was where uh, Tanzania, Luanda Basin, that's where they started in Gondwana times. And of course, this is where they are now. So, so we. I uh, just wanted to, to, to reinforce the fact that we uh, we're looking at the rocks uh, here now, but we have to always think of them in a latitudinal uh, position inside a supercontinent in a place there. And the evidence for that is what we find from the rocks themselves. So, big research questions. I've been getting on at them already, but uh, how has this continental drift influenced this evolution of life on Earth? How has uh, the, the continents coming together into supercontinent Pangaea and then breaking apart 
into what we have today, sorry, the other way around, coming together in supercontinent and breaking apart to today. How has all that influenced the evolution of life on Earth? Of course, it has to have an influence. We just need to get the evidence for it. And what role have the rift valleys played in that evolution, especially uh, in the terrestrial uh, ecosystems? You get rifts in, uh, in, um, under the sea as well, but I'm particularly interested in terrestrial ecosystems. And did dinosaurs actually, did the whole idea of dinosaurs originate in the rift valleys of Africa? That's a, a tantalizing thing. And of course, uh, that's what this talk's all about. Dinosaurs uh, are uh, archosaurs. This is the archosauromorph, uh, archosaur lineage, the pink stuff. They're, they're all reptiles with uh, two holes in the backs of their, their heads, the diapsid reptiles. Uh, but um, around 235 million years ago, which is, which is around the, the, uh, the time at which uh, um, I'm going to be taking you back into in the rift valleys of Zambia and Tanzania. There was uh, uh, this. If you draw a line here, we'll see that there are uh, uh, this, this, the root stock of the dinosaurs, but they hadn't really yet taken off to diversify. So we sh we had their sort of ancestors, if you like, the archosauromorphs. Uh, we had some uh, 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 reptiles which were going to become lizards and snakes, some squamate type uh, reptiles. Uh, but we also had these animals here. These were the therapsids. And the therapsids, of course, gave rise right at this time to mammals. The other intriguing question is what influence, what influenced that break? Because that break? This, this branch here was forced by the environment. What environmental factors caused that, um, that lineage to branch off and eventually lead to mammals. So I'm looking at the origins of mammals and the origins of dinosaurs. Uh, Ruhu basin there, Luango basin there. So that they are uh, separated to com two completely separate basins. They always have been, even in the past. They're not sort of eroded remnants of something much larger. But we do now know that, that although they were physically separated depressions in the past, they did allow animals uh, and plants to migrate uh, between them because we do see similarities in their fossil fauna. Um, that's the study area right next to, to, the, um, to the lake, sorry, Lake Nyasa. And uh, that, that block you just saw uh, resolved now in a simple geological uh, thing. This is basically, as, the geo as a control geologist on all these trips, I have to basically uh, make sure that the paleontologists uh, know, uh, I know where all the fossils come from, and uh, I, I then give them um, the locality data and, and uh, collect their locality data and plot them such that we can work out what age they are from which strata they uh, occur in. So the, the uh, whites, uh, the white open spots, they are Triassic, uh, middle Triassic um, fossils, and these uh, black crosses are uh, Permian fossils. So we, we do have uh, in here a Permian and Triassic uh, boundary, if you like, and it would occur into this, in this, uh, this yellow spotted uh, Kingori member, uh, but as yet, I have not been able to pinpoint the exact 252 million year marker in there because unfortunately, we don't have fossils in the intervening bit. We've got fossils in Triassic, fossils in Permian, but we haven't been yet able to find fossils in there. But that's one of the targets that I intend to, uh, to, to complete before I stop doing this. To them. So in one of the um, things that I also have to do is to reconstruct the environments. Uh, in fact, it's my main aim. It's, it's what I like to do best. The environments being not just the physical landscape, but the biological landscape as well. So it's the ecosystems that I am, uh, I am especially interested in. So from this uh, Kingori ecosystem with uh, these braided systems, braided river uh, facies uh, into into the Lifua, the 235 million year one, which is much more meandering river, uh, much more green, uh, more vegetated floodplains, 
And these, especially these uh, oxbows, cutoffs, this, this uh, idea that there were lots more ponds around at that time. And I've, uh, because of the work, uh, because the fossils are preserved in these pond type environments, these sort of environments that, uh, that didn't exist at this time, uh, we couldn't, couldn't find them in these facies, that uh, there, there certainly is something um, uh, happening around these pond type environments in this Rift Valley around 235 million years ago. So that's the, uh, the Kingori, the one we can't find any fossils in. And this is the Lakua member, which we can find fossils in. And if I blow that little bit up, uh, this is now blown up to this. That's the complete section. So all this is really that little bit there. Uh, there are fossils in this part and the fossils at the, right at the base. And this one's right at the very base here, are almost in the Kingori where we can't find fossils, but they are the, 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 the very significant uh, um, first fossils, if you like, in the Triassic of, uh, of Tanzania. And we have actually been able to get, uh, I think a little thing, we have actually been able to get a detrital, youngest detrital zircon date at that level here of 246. So it puts us in the right, uh, uh, um, in the middle Triassic uh, of, uh, in the middle Triassic period, the Anisian. Uh, lots of <coughs> field trips have been there. I've been there, I think, five or six times to, to, to Tanzania, to these areas, uh, with different groups. But there's also a, there's a, basically a core group in there. You'll see them repeated. Uh, they are from Chicago, from Seattle, and from uh, Cape Town. That's the core group. My, uh, my job there is, as I say, is to the geological base. And I, this is my field map, which is becoming more and more it dog eared as, as it comes, it's dragged out more and more. But it's on this that I build up story. These are, weren't all found at once, these were found over the, a, 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 a 10 years of, of field, uh, field work. We only spent three weeks uh, a year there, but uh, generally all those fossils now have been found. And you'll see that there are patches of them in the uh, different, these are all the Permian fossils and these are the uh, Triassic fossils. I want, to look sh I want to show you this one first because it's our first inkling of uh, what is to come. This is the uh, locality, it's in the Permian and, and we never thought for one minute that we would find, uh, let's say, uh, archosaurs or uh, archosaur ancestors, uh, the, the ancestors of the dinosaurs down in the Permian because that has never been found before, but there is uh, the specimen. You can see how big it is. Uh, that's my wedding ring for scale. You can see how big that is. <laughs> um, there's, these are tiny bones in there, but even as it was picked up, it looked like a, a, a coprolite, as, you know, as, a, as a fossil dropping, but I could see complete bones, and the bones were definitely, uh, there's limb bones there, there are finger bones in there. I could see they were very definitely not so rapsid uh, because of the length of them and their fragile, their, that's a, uh, um, these are, these are uh, phalanges, finger bones, and a uh, very, very weird thing. So uh, that uh, has now been scanned and, and lots of, uh, lots of interesting uh, bones now inside them because uh, CT scanning can now resolve. It's full of bones and there's also this other green stuff which they are pretty certain is uh, fossilized skin in there. So the idea of being coprolite is quite, uh, quite good and may well be an upchuck or a regurgitate rather than an actual one that passed right through the gut because it's so well preserved. All the resolution of the bones, look at the perfect, uh, that's the humerus of the animal, there's the fingers, the, the hand of the animal. But uh, all in all, I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of work, it's all been um, presented, but I want to show you, this is the terminal phalanx or the ungol, that's the claw, if you like. And that claw is curved, is, is, is hooked, if you like. And uh, to an animal like this, a small uh, animal with hooked claws, this is very, uh, uh, very um, likely to be a, an arboreal adaptation, just uh, uh, such as this. So the, the, an animal such as this, uh, with hooked claws, doing a lemur-like um, uh, habitat uh, is, is what we've got, but it is a diapsid. It is it is on the lineage towards uh, dinosaurs, if you like. So 
So already in the Permian, we've got our first um, sniff of dinos. Uh, but now let's go up into the base of the Triassic. This is, this is the King Glory where we can't find fossils. Uh, they're right on the very top of it because these rocks are dipping down like this. Is, the, uh, is another uh, very important fossil locality which uh, I must admit I did find. So uh, it's not, uh, that's why I'm telling you about it. But uh, generally, uh, I'm, I'm there as a geologist, but one of the other things I do is find a lot of fossils. So this is the, um, this is our camp there, uh, typical field camp, and typical uh, difficulties in getting across country, and a lot of grass. Grass is the biggest uh, headache there. Um, we don't burn off grass like the old British explorers did, but uh, we, uh, we just live with it, but it is uh, quite a hassle. But there, in amongst uh, the grass, if you like, there are these washouts or dongas, and in this particular one, uh, I, it was in here that I, in fact, down here that I found some loose bones. And uh, just walking around here, I was uh, amazed by how many different loose bones, not only that, different types or different taxa, different sizes and shapes of bones that I could see already contain therapsid and archosaur bones. So the, uh, without, without sort of going in there, uh, clomping over everything, I brought the team over and we put then every little clump of loose bones, this is, these are just lying on surface, onto, uh, onto individual um, 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 sample bags so that we start to get an idea of where the bones were coming from because uh, the, this, uh, there's potential here for a multi-taxa, multi-species uh, multi uh, bone bed where the bones were coming out uh, bone on bone on bone uh, it, as a, an, an accumulation. This is Chris Cito from uh, Seattle. He and I have been working together for 20 years now, uh, but he is a cynodont specialist. The, the cynodont is the lineage that led to mammals. So he's there to find how uh, these Rift Valley cynodonts were adapting to becoming mammals. Uh, in this particular one, uh, that's what was found on surface. Uh, he is then uh, arranged them in, into elements that he can be sure of. And <coughs> these are legs. There are four legs. <coughs> so there was one big animal here, and he said quite correctly at the time that that is an animal known as Cynognathus. It's a large cynodont. Uh, looks something like that. So there is four legs, and in fact, as we're doing, we actually found five legs. So there was more than one cynodont in in this bone bed. That's an interesting specimen because Cynognathus is something that we have in our main Karoo Basin. This is from the, from the big Sag Basin in South Africa, the big foreland basin. Uh, this Cynognathus uh, zone is up here in the Triassic, in the Burgersdorp Formation. Uh, around Alleyville North, uh, that's a great place to, uh, to look at fossils and rocks of this state. But the Cynognathus itself is there, so we already now have a very a biostratigraphic check or marker or, or um, confirmation that they we're dealing with the Middle Triassic period. So having uh, collected and logged all the surface stuff, it, it then became, uh, we then needed to find out where they were coming from. We had a pretty good idea that there was some in situ material just here, but to do it properly, we needed to bring down the whole river bank. For that, we employ the local, uh, local um, laborers coming, coming from the village. We pick them up in the village and uh, take them out into the grasslands. Uh, they helped us uh, bring the uh, river burden down to the bone bearing layer uh, and uh, we spent the whole day for, for a week just excavating, uh, uh, excavating the bones. The bone bearing layer in fact is, is right here. It's, um, it's, it's in a, a fine grained sandstone uh, which has all the uh, makings, uh, all, all the characters of what's known as a crevasse splay channel. That's now not in the main big meandering system of it, and it's not right out there on the, in the ponds, but it is in a, a channel that's leading from the main, the main river into the floodplain. So it only flows during flood season, uh, and the rest of the time it's dry, and in that 
channel setting, that's the accumulation mechanism for the uh, for this type of uh, bone accumulation. It doesn't, doesn't look like much here, but all these are bones, bone upon bone upon bone uh, of um, of an animal, which I'll show you later, which actually is a very uh, new type of archosaurumal, very primitive, uh, pre-dinosaur, if you like, but definitely a, a diapsid. Uh, as the bones are coming out, you can see it looks a bit haphazard, but every single position of every single bone that comes out of the bone bed is is mapped. This is this is my map of the quarry. Uh, but obviously it gets very complicated because bones are on bones are on bones. But just this little, just this, even this, this, this uh, sketch of how the bones were lying is incredibly important when it comes to later on when you're trying to match up bones, trying to match up skeletons, or trying to work out what happened here to 35 million years ago or to 46 million years ago. So, so uh, these uh, circles around are the plaster jackets you can see in them. So these are where the bones have been taken out in jackets and, and uh, their disposition. So, so this quarry map is another of my responsibilities out there in the, uh, in the, um, on the site. This, we'll have a look at this specimen. Obviously, it's a large skull here, and that's uh, a dicynodont skull. Uh, that's uh, it's Sangasaurus parentonii. Uh, that's the skull. There's the, there's the uh, sorry the <coughs> flying. That's that's the left eye. Yeah. So uh, that's the left eye. That's the right eye. The snout is here. There's the back of the head. And there's large single single hole at the back of the head just there. That's what that skull looks like in reconstruction. A tortoise-like beak, uh, a horny covered beak, very large herbivore uh, dicynodonts. And uh, although we don't have this uh, taxa, this genus, in uh, the main Karoo Basin, um, this is what the dicynodonts were looking like in the, uh, in the Rift Valleys at that time. Again, uh, getting these things out is not easy. Uh, uh, they're very heavy once they're in the plaster jackets, so uh, we enlist the help of uh, of the locals for carrying them back to the vehicle. Uh, they, these are some of the archosaur bones. Uh, it's a limb bone, uh, a femur, and uh, there's a, a rib. And uh, that's taken out. We use plaster uh, bandages. The medical plaster bandages are a lot. They're very expensive, but they're very useful because they need minimum water. And out there where you've got to carry all your water in and out, um, we end up using our drinking water for plastering, which is not good. You know. But anyway, the, the bones from this quarry, you can see now after preparation, beautifully, beautifully uh, preserved. And all those, uh, all those um, uh, colored, all those colored elements in there are, uh, are what we have of this animal. So we've got a pretty good idea of what it looked like. It's called Telio Crater. Uh, Radinus, uh, we've uh, named that, or, or the, the paleontologists from uh, the states named it this, and uh, it's it's obviously a carnivore, you know. So, so. But it's uh, it's still very it's dinosaur uh, in in the dinosaur lineage. It's an archosauromorph, not an archosaur. So it is still uh, it's it's going to become a dinosaur later on, but uh, at this time. These are, this was a time when the archosauromorphs ruled the world, not the archosaurs, not the dinosaurs. So let's uh, have another look at another uh, locality in that area, but higher up in the succession, in the middle of the Lufua. So it's, this, is, this is slightly uh, younger in age. This is around 235 uh, uh, million years. Uh, this is the locality. It doesn't look like any sort of uh, locality which would uh, indicate any anything uh, special there, but uh, uh, that was the first fossil found on the surface, and alongside it some uh, some vertebrae, uh, and that this chap uh, that's is this Sterling Nesbitt from uh, Virginia Tech uh, in the states. Um, and he recognized these, of course, it doesn't, you don't have to be an expert to recognize these are spondylus vertebrae, in other words, cotton reel shaped uh, vertebrae, and they are elongate. 
These are a typical tail vertebrae of something with a long tail, but we do know that they are uh, archosaur vertebrae, so they are in the archosaur line. So these are definitely dinosaurs. So there's our first dinosaur from, uh, from this area. Uh, the, uh, the stuff as it was collected looks like this and is covered in this knobbly calcareous with a little bit of hematite in there, but it's mostly uh, calcite, uh, but it's got a, that texture of, of calcrete, if you like. But it's very th a very thin layer of it, and it's formed in these um, pond deposits. They're formed, this type of calcrete forms around the edges of a pond as the pond dries up. So we've got this uh, an interesting scenario now that we've got evidence of pond drying, we've got evidence of vegetation and roots and things and, and pond life, as well as uh, bones. So is there a link between the drying up of the ponds and the uh, accumulation of the bones? And I think, yes, of course, there, there is. The, the bones are there because the water body was a, attracting or, or, or became a focus for the uh, tetrapod life at that time, not just the dinosaurs, but the the the, um, the not just the herbivorous dinosaurs, but the carnivores as well, herbivores and carnivores all together in these uh, in these deposits. Here's another one, uh, a very similar deposit, very similar uh, outcrop, uh, with very similar taphonomic style. That is this similar. Um, uh, uh, a disarticulation of the skeletons. They're all disarticulated, but they're all uh, preserved uh, as individual bones. So the bones are, have fallen apart, but they haven't broken up. Uh, this is just what you're looking at, and if you look sort of more closely at that, for instance, that is, that is what you were looking at. That's a jaw with these beautiful cloverleaf teeth on it. And it's, and it's preserved there, well, apart from the cracks, it's, it looks like it's a perfectly modern bone. You know? So, so there's, a, there's a beautiful uh, archosaur dorsal vertebrae, small, a small dinosaur vertebrae with all the neural canal and, and uh, the, the centrum uh, preserved, lying there as if it was just uh, died yesterday. But these are um, 235 million years old. Uh, so that's the surface collecting of these, and you see we've got some complete, well they're all, they are actually complete elements. Look at the beautiful complete element. This is a juvenile, it's, it's, uh, the epiphysis is still not fully ossified. And, um, uh, but that's the sort of jumble of bones that, uh, that we can get from the surface collecting. And then as we, uh, in the evenings, we've got to sort out, sort out what we've got. You know, we don't try and do any taxonomy out there. Uh, this, this is the expert, of course. He's the archosaur guy. This guy is the dicynodont expert. Uh, and he's a, um, he's a, um, he's a soil, he's a paleosol expert. So, uh, Starting now to put these, these skeletons back together, starting to, to the matches, because uh, sometimes these part elements, these parts of the bone are, are scattered in modern times, you know, by the, by the modern storms, uh, such that uh, they will be found far apart, but we can put them back together. So our evenings that spent uh, after, uh, whilst we're drinking, we are uh, putting these things back together. <laughs> This is now how this uh, this particular one uh, has has it's, that's what it looks like now, beautifully um, curated, and it's been given a name now, a Silisaurus Congo. It's a new archosauromorph, a new type of uh, of pre-dinosaur dinosaur. Uh, that's the scale of it in, in relation to a human, uh, and that's now we've got a lot of the skeleton uh, in uh, over the years we've been able to pretty much put this thing uh, back together as a, as a complete animal, uh, and that's it. Uh, that's, a, that's a reconstruction uh, with some skin on. You notice it's got this little horny, keratinous uh, beak. We, we just didn't know how it finished off its snout, because we could never find that until we found there's a little bit in there, the, 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 in fact, in here, the premax inside there, a little bit of bone which is just fits in there 
on which the, the horned beak uh, fits. And it took us a, a lot of finding, a lot of looking to find that little tiny element to prove or to, to confirm that it had this little horny uh, beak on the end and not incisors. <coughs> so it's, um, it got published in Nature, but we, uh, we mocked up a, a front cover for Nature, but unfortunately they, they found something else, some, uh, some molecular story to put on the front, you know, not half as interesting as this, but, uh, but that's what, uh, if you want to get stuff in Nature and you get on the front cover, that is the ultimate, of course, so, but we've been pretty, pretty s successful. In terms of the uh, uh, phylogeny, now that's the, the sort of, the whole uh, evolution of dinosauria, there's a Silisaurus sitting there just off, just off the main uh, line towards the true dinosaurs. So it's a pre-dinosaur, but very close to the true dinosaurs. So nice stuff. Filling in the, the uh, phylogenetic tree in this middle Triassic period, which is a bit empty. Uh, again, we're going to go further into the, uh, the, this part, into the grasslands there. Um, it's now uh, in, in a, we, we, we were over here before, we're going to go over to this, this, this little place, the Timber Kuwambe. That's that we've camped in the village next to the Catholic mission station there. Uh, and we, uh, this, this is a, another one of those very innocuous, uninteresting looking outcrops. In fact, it's hardly an outcrop, but uh, incredibly uh, on this slope here, there was just hundreds of, of fossils, uh, and they're all coming out of that, that very, that's, this is that rough textured calcareous material, another pond deposit. So there's a skull, a complete skull of a cynodon, very nice uh, uh, preservation of something uh, that would have uh, looked like that. Um, okay, I'm sorry that, that uh, it, it, my illustration over the, uh, the excavation. Um, and that, you notice that one we put hair on because by this time, these are sufficiently advanced towards mammalness to, to uh, have at least whiskers. We're sure we had whiskers, but they well, could well have had hair on as well. There's actually, as, it was, as you find it, that's the lower jaw, and these are teeth. You can see those teeth? That's, so that's just how it's lying there, uh, a ventral up. A beautiful little cynodont with, uh, with its teeth. And that's the, flip it over, that's the dorsal surface. There's the, uh, uh, <coughs> these are the large temporal openings, the holes in the back of the head, and the orbits are here and here on the side of the head, and that's the snout. So a very nice uh, uh, specimen. And that uh, was found on that slope, and look at this. This, this, is, this is a clump of these of which, of course, are coprolites. So coprolites accumulating in these systems is, uh, is, is a very good indication of pond deposit. We know that now because we get associated uh, bivalves, the uh, mollusks as well, with these coprolites all sort of being preferentially preserved in the margins and actually probably under the water of the pond. So these coprolites could well have been preserved because they were uh, dropped into shallow water at the edge of the pond. Some of them contain these uh, spiral shapes, so that indicates it rolling up in that spiral gut, and that is uh, an indication of a, uh, a tennis spondyl or a shark. Both of those have uh, a spiral valve in their lower intestines such that they uh, form what they call uh, spiral coprolites. So again, we've got some aquatic uh, uh, evidence of aquatic animals here, um, as well as, uh, as the, um, the geological uh, and the paleo paleosol evidence of, of the bone accumulation. So on this, on this big, uh, Outcrop, a very much more uh, heroic outcrop. Uh, there were basically um, three bone accumulation sites, all associated with these ancient pond deposits. I want to <coughs> talk about this, this very unusual uh, specimen just now. But well, that's what it looks like down on the ground. Uh, again, um, 
very red uh, mud rocks, su suggesting that the oxygen, uh, that the uh, the environment at that time was was periodically drying out and oxidizing all the uh, the iron in the clay minerals in these pond deposits. But you can see it's predominantly fine-grained mudstone that we're finding the fossils in. This is an accumulation of cynodonts uh, jaws, that's the lower jaw, with the teeth and the two big tusks. So these are, these are the uh, precursors to mammals, if you like. But what we're getting here are these most unusual, uh, what's known as gomphodont or, or uh, 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 laterally, wide, laterally expanded post-canine teeth, which are certainly not, uh, so, uh, certainly not uh, characteristic of carnivals. So this is the first uh, evidence of herbivorous cynodonts. Cynodonts which are normally, up until this point, have always been carnivals. Suddenly, we see herbivorous carnivals. No, herbivor herbivorous cynodonts. Uh, so what what caused the uh, these cynodonts to, to have both carnivorous and herbivorous uh, representatives? And I think it's because of these pond environments, these habitats, these diversity hotspots where everything was going on and uh, look at the uh, cusps on the teeth of this. So clearly this is now an advanced cynodont. It's well on its way to become a new mammal, but it's not a mammal, unfortunately. Um, uh, but the, the, uh, the, the cusps on that are such that uh, that can these, the, these are the cusps on that. Now these are the cusps of a carnivorous um, cynodont and something like that. So you can see the beautiful in, uh, interlocking incisors on the snout of it with a small, uh, very sharp uh, uh, canine tusk. So a crickodon, that's what it's, this is called, and that's how it's been reconstructed. Very, very, very definitely uh, a, a candidate for having hair and being warm-blooded, of course. So, so although it's still not a mammal, it is looking very mammal-like, acting very mammal-like, and doing everything mammals do. So if you do what mammals do, you will eventually become a mammal. So there's a... There's an intriguing specimen. This is this is this is this is brilliant because uh, uh, this is not being found before, and nobody would ever think that that was a fossil. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't think that was a fossil. But I, uh, I, I, I saw it because I've been working in the Burgersdorf beds in South Africa, and there we looked for these things. And they're called Procolophon. And nobody had ever thought that there would be Procolophon out in uh, Rift Valleys, but there it is. That's the, uh, the skull of a, of a, um, a para-reptile, it's a true reptile, on the lineage towards turtles and tortoises. So this is not going to be a dinosaur. This is going to be a turtle and tortoise in later, uh, in later years, once, once you get into the late Triassic, early Jurassic. But at this time, there is the skull. The, the orbits and the post, uh, the, the orbits are not um, uh, uh, irregular shape. They're all orbit, but there's no large holes in the back of the head. It is an anapsid reptile. That's what, uh, and it's now been given a name, Mandafon and Nadra. That's, that's what it would have looked like. So it's great to fill out the diversity of the animals in this area. Uh, that again is a snout uh, of a carnivore. That's actually the tusk of that carnivore uh, canine. And there's incisors here. It's sticking out, there's the orbit, there's the right eye of the animal sticking out of this rubbery calcrete, the ancient calcrete. Um, again, just died on the edge of, um, of, the, uh, of that old pond. But this one, <coughs> fortunately or luckily, um, did not fall apart significantly such that we could bring it back and uh, have we now have that as a skeleton. This is, this is what I do to. Um, to highlight what's inside the, uh, the jacket so that the preparators know what to expect when they take the jacket, the top of the jacket off. But um, when the kids saw this inside there, they, uh, they were really scared. They, that really scared them and, and uh, the guys told me to take it away because they think that we are um, 
capturing their dogs and putting them, <laughs> putting them inside. Anyway, so, so this is what a reconstruction of this animal would have liked. But uh, I've, I learned the lesson now not to draw the skeletons on the outside of these things. Because some of them may look like humans. <laughs> but uh, this is a big snout of a Dysanodon. There's the Dysanodon expert. He's now very happy. He's found himself a very nice, complete skull of this. This is, this is as complete as you get, but extremely well... Um, well-preserved uh, skull of Sanguisaurus, that, that sort of thing. So he got his he got his uh, uh, specimen to describe. Uh, this locality proved uh, really uh, pretty rich in. This is this is a, this is the maxilla. This is the snout of a very unusual pre-dinosaur dinosaur, uh, plus some uh, very advanced cynodont material. These are the bones just lying on the surface. Beautiful dinosaur bones lying in the, in the soil, if you like, weathered out of the mud rocks underneath, and that, uh, that tooth, look at the cusps, the wear. that's a very unusual uh, type of tooth. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, very, it's, it's not known whether this is actually a herbivorous or carnivorous tooth. It's very uh, derived but extremely interesting type of tooth of a, of a cynodont that we're not quite sure of, of its life habit, but they, they call it mandicomphodont hershogonite. So because of this, uh, the, the, uh, the intricate um, uh, cusps on the top, but as yet we haven't been able to find the complete tooth row of the bottom and the top, such we don't know how those teeth actually worked together to form that. In this outcrop, uh, uh, this uh, I was I was fortunate enough to discover this one as well, uh, but uh, fortunate in a way, but not necessarily that fortunate because what I saw were these two articulated uh, bones uh, sticking out on surface. And as anybody knows, if if you've got some articulation, you've got to go in. And as I was digging around and digging around, it appeared to be uh, a skeleton which was still together but uh, we didn't know whether the head was off here or not here, and so I went and put my hammer through here, and it hit something hard, and lo and behold, it was the head. So uh, that, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's called, they, they call it a discovery nick, that hole that my hammer made in the head, but otherwise they call it smithing it. <laughs> but at least we found the head, and the head was on the, uh, that's the most peculiar skull. And in fact, you, would, you wouldn't know which way it was front or back. So there's, there's actually the orbit, and this is the front. This, this is the, that, the, that peculiar beak that these things have. They have very, no well, they have teeth on their, on their palate. They have a battery of teeth on their palate, and these peculiar, very sharp beak. It's a wrinkle sort. There's the skull, 